very good morning to everybody and good morning we continue with the study of drig drishya viveka um the f- we are on the sixth verse and a new topic has been started remember the first verse the main take away from all of this the analysis of the seer and the seen forms are seen eyes see them the eyes are experienced seen and the mind is the seer step back further thoughts in the mind are seen and the witness consciousness is the seer the r- the real seer the final seer is that witness consciousness that is what i am chidananda roopah shivoham pure consciousness now a question might arise if that's what i am then what's all this how am i trapped in this body and mind how do i relate to this body and mind how is that pure consciousness related to this body and mind so that's what's going to be taken up in the next few verses what we shall do this morning and it gives us a very precise insight into vedanta i'll share that with you towards the end of this class what exactly is the path of knowledge what exactly is advaita vedanta what does it do actually we will see that so verse number 6 chichaya veshato buddhau bhanam dhistu dvidha sthita eka hankriti anyasyad antah karana rupini what does it mean consciousness when i say the ultimate seer is is consciousness immediately what we think is yeah i get it i am conscious right now i am aware i am sentient we all are we right now we feel consciousness within ourselves so is that the witness self is that atman is that brahman is that the ultimate reality which vedanta speaks about that consciousness which we all feel right now that we are conscious beings vedanta says actually not so the consciousness that we feel right now this awareness in the mind which we feel now is a reflection of the witness consciousness is a reflection of the real the pure consciousness the pure consciousness we don't have a notion about it now what we have right now is this reflected consciousness the word used in sanskrit is chit chaya literally it means the shadow or reflection of consciousness chit consciousness chaya reflection or shadow it's a bit like this at night we don't see the sun we don't see sunlight but in one sense we do because it's the sunlight reflected from the moon which illumines the world when you see the world shining in moonlight basically what's happening is that the sun shines on the moon and the moon reflects that sunlight to earth and with that reflected light we see the world at night this is exactly what is happening pure consciousness we don't seem to understand what is meant by that we understand what the world is we understand what the body is we understand what the mind is we even understand what is meant by consciousness in the mind so far so good but what is this pure consciousness they're talking about just like the sun at night it's not visible but its effects are visible because of that consciousness because of that pure consciousness the atman our minds are lit up just like the moon is lit up not by its own light we say moonlight but its moon doesn't have even a little bit of light it's by the light of the unseen sun at night that the moon is lit up and by that moonlight we experience the world in the same way it is by the light of the atman of, of pure consciousness the witness i use this word synonymously the witness sakshi atman self brahman the ultimate reality they are all that one same pure consciousness they are different words now exactly like that the mind has the capacity being a uh, very fine mind has the capacity to reflect consciousness and then use that consciousness for what for exactly this for seeing for hearing 
for smelling, tasting, touching, for thinking, for all our conscious experiences. In fact, I'd like to share with you, an, just an aside, right now a very uh, a popular subject, very interesting subject in the scientific world is consciousness studies. It's interesting that um, even 20, 25 or 30 years ago, this scientist did not seem to be interested in consciousness. At the most, body, mind, that's it. But consciousness studies is a big thing right now. And if you Google consciousness studies, Google hard problem of consciousness, hard problem. There's a central question in consciousness studies which seems to puzzle all the scientists, the scientists and philosophers and uh, linguists and uh, psychologists and neuroscientists, so many, it's a multidisciplinary subject, consciousness studies. But there is a question that puzzles all of them. How is it that a physical system like this body, how is it like a physical system like the brain and the nervous system, completely physical, the doctors can see it, this physical system, how does it generate a subjective experience? You see, what is meant by subjective experience is, when you are looking at me, right now when you're looking at this stage, you have an experience. And the neuroscientist will tell you such and such neurons are firing in your brain and giving you that experience. Now, our experience is not of neurons firing. You see colors, you hear sound, you think thoughts, you feel happy, you feel unhappy. All of these things are subjective first-person experiences. How can an objective thing, how can a piece of matter like the brain generate a completely subjective first-person experience? That is something that they cannot understand at all. And they call it the hard problem of consciousness. Here is an interesting approach to the hard problem of consciousness. It is pure consciousness itself shining on the mind which gives you these subjective experiences. This is the uh, Vedantic or Advaitic uh, perspective on the hard problem of consciousness. Anyway, let's go ahead with this. Because of the reflection of consciousness in the mind. Now, the mind itself, here the author divides into two parts. One is ego. Right now, if you look into the mind, you will feel an I sense. I not in this. I as the vertical I. I. I, I am thinking. So that I. And the other part he divides and he calls it Antakkarana, the inner instrument. In traditional Vedanta, here he's doing something new. In traditional Vedanta, when we study the mind, we divide it into four parts. Mano, Buddhi, Chitta, Ahankara. The mind itself, which thinks, buddhi, intellect, which understands, ego, which says, I, I, I am thinking, I am listening, so I. And the memory, chitta, the storehouse of all memories and impressions. So four parts, traditional division. Mind, mind itself is divided into actually the mind, mind intellect, ego and memory. Mana, buddhi, chitta, ahankara. In fact, some of you who chant the Nirvana Shatakam of Shankaracharya, you will see the first line of that, the first line of that beautiful hymn where he says, I am pure consciousness, I am of the nature of Shiva. The first line is very interesting. It says, Mano buddhya hankara chittani naham. I am not the mind, I am not the intellect, I am not the ego, I am not the memory. This is precisely who we normally think we are. The person, the little person, my memories. Now all augmented by selfies and you know, wherever people go I see uh, tourists. The first thing is they're not looking at uh, the beautiful sight in front of them. They're taking, busy taking pictures. It's the camera which gets to enjoy the, the, the beautiful place you go to. In Upanishads, in one of the places it said, why do we not realize the inner self? And the answer is given that because our senses flow outwards. We see the world outside, we do not see inwards. Paran chikhani vetrinat swayam buddhis. In one of the Upanishads it's there. That our senses are all turned outwards. So we see things, we hear things, we smell and touch and taste. 
we think about those things, we never once take a look inside. Um, I was saying this in a talk once, and the next speaker stood up and said, the Swami said, the problem is that we see the world outside, we do not see inside. Well, the Swami is wrong. You know, it would be, it would be nice if we saw the world outside, but today we are all looking at our screens, we are not even seeing the world outside. So we are, we are in this digital age, we are all looking at our smartphones, you know, not, not even seeing the world outside. But anyway, here the author has done something new. Instead of dividing the mind into four parts, mind, intellect, ego and memory, he divides the mind into two parts, the ego and the rest of the mind. Why he's doing this, we will see very soon. Eka hankriti, one is ego. And the other one is antakarana, the inner instrument, the rest of the mind. So just basically a division. Now he's going to use that to explain something. Verse 7. Yes. Chaya hankara yo raikyam taptaya pindavan matam tada hankara tadatmyat what he says is, first I'll translate the verse directly for you and then explain. The reflected consciousness and the ego, they become identified. And he gives an example. A ball of iron in a blast furnace in a factory, it glows red hot. A ball of iron which is heated in a blast furnace in a factory, it glows red hot. So the heat, the fire element and the iron, they are identified. They seem to be one and the same. Exactly like that, reflected consciousness and the ego seem to be one and the same. They become completely identified. And because of that, the mind seems conscious. Because of that, the sensory system seems conscious. And because of that, the whole body seems conscious. You see, the question can be raised, this answer to the question. The question is, you are talking about a pure consciousness. Well and good, I don't know. I don't know about that. But what I do know is, the mind feels conscious, right? Right now, the mind feels conscious. Though this early in the morning, for some people, it might not feel very conscious. The mind feels conscious and even the body feels conscious. One of the Upanishads says that the consciousness percolates down to the tip of your, of your finger, to the tip of your fingers. Uh, so the whole body feels conscious. When you do, for example, yoga nidra, the technique of yoga nidra, we'll do, we'll do it today I think. You will see how the awareness will be circulated all over your body. So the body feels aware. How does the body, you said that consciousness is separate and the mind and the body are separate. We are the witness of the mind and the body. But how does the body feel conscious? It's this mechanism is explained here. What happens is, pure consciousness is reflected in the mind and it becomes identified with the mind. The mind feels conscious. Mind's, mind feels lit up. Just like the moon at night. The moon is lit up. You can, in fact, when we were kids, we studied luminous bodies in the, in the sky and we would say moon is a luminous body, which is strictly not true. It's a borrowed light. In the same way, the mind is strictly not conscious. It's an object of consciousness, but it feels conscious because of the, the reflection of consciousness in it. Um, one of the terms used for reflection of consciousness in Vedanta is chidabhasa, reflected consciousness. Here he uses a different term, chit chaya, also means reflection or shadow of consciousness. Because of that, the mind is lit up. And when the mind is lit up, next what happens, the, the consciousness is transferred to the sensory system. So our eyes, as it were, are lit up. We often use in English, his or her eyes lit up. You know? So l the ears and the other senses, uh, all of this feels alive and conscious and the whole body feels alive and conscious. It's transmitted through the nerves to the, to the corners of the body. So, what it says here, Dehas Chetanatam Agat, finally the body itself also feels conscious. The mind, you know, one e nice example is, 
when the sun is shining, all these surfaces, the trees and the roads, they all reflect sunlight. But if you look at, say, a pot of water, you, it, it, it also reflects sunlight, but there is also the image of the sun. You will find a little tiny sun in that, in that water. Do you not see a drop, a dew drop on, on a leaf? When you look at it shining in the sunlight, you will find a tiny sun reflected in the dew drop. So all surfaces reflect sunlight, but all of them do not form a reflection of the sun itself. Only some, like transparent surfaces like the water, forms it. Exactly like that, in all the things in the world, it's only in the body and in the mind that consciousness gets reflected. And it's able to use that consciousness to experience the world. So this is verse number 7. Now we go to verse number 8. Why are we do talking about all of this? There is a point and it's coming. It's a brilliant point. Point uh, Verse number 8 goes like this. Ahankarasya tadatmyam jitchaya deha sakshibhi sahajam karmajam bhranti janyam chatrividham kramat Remember, he divided the mind into two parts, ego and the rest of the mind. Now take up the ego. You know, one, I'll stop here for a while and explain uh, just an aside. The way you approach things in the path of knowledge is threefold, three steps. First, the text is studied. So at the first step, one must be able to say what the text said. So at the end of the class, at least, you're free to say, I didn't understand what the text said. I have not, I don't feel th that to be real yet. But you, you, can, you have to say, I know what the text said. After the class, this is the minimum that one expects, that the text said, said this, the teacher said this, this much I know. Yeah, I don't get it. I don't understand it. That's perfectly all right. That's the next stage. So the first stage is, one must understand what the text is teaching. So that is called... Shravana, the first stage in Vedantic inquiry. Literally, it means hearing, systematic study, at the end of which we know what the text said. So, Shravana. Now, then, after I can say that I know what the text said, but I can say that I don't understand it. We go to the second stage where I raise questions and I discuss it and I reason it through. The second stage is called Mananam, which is thinking and reasoning and arguing it through till one can say, I know what the text said, and now I get it. I understand what it says. I have some clarity. That's the second stage. The third stage is, the third stage is meditation, nididhyasanam or meditation. What is this stage? In the beginning, of, in the first stage we said, I know the text, but I don't understand it. Second stage, I know the text, and I understand it. But now what's the problem? I understand that I'm not the body and mind. I am the, I am the witness. I sort of get what they're trying to say. But it's not real to me yet. I still behave like the body. I still feel like the body. And I suffer also. So the benefits which were promised, that I can transcend suffering and get peace and joy, that's not real yet. So to make it real and living, the third stage is there, which is meditation. Meditation on what? What we have learned from the text and what's clear now after the second stage. That clear knowledge, you meditate upon it to assimilate it, to make it a living fact. So these are the three stages in Vedanta, in the path of knowledge. Literally hearing, reasoning, meditating. Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana. Now, This third stage, which makes it real for us, consider that for a moment. I'll ask you a question. The question is real or theory? What's the question? Real or theory? What do you think? The first verse which we did, the most important verse, the first one. I told you there were four stages to it. 
step one, step two, step three, step four. The first stage is forms are seen and the eyes are the seer. Let me ask you, is this real to us or is it just theory? You don't seem to be confident. <laughs> it's real. You're right here looking at me. So the eyes are seeing and this is seen. All of this is seen. This is seen. All of this is seen. So eyes are the seer and the forms are seen. Real or theory? Confidence. With confidence this time. Real. Yeah, it's a fact. You should say, yeah, real. Go on. Get on with it. <laughs> Second, let's go deeper. The eyes are seen and the mind is the seer. Eyes are open. The mind knows it. The eyes are closed, the mind knows it. I need glasses to see well, the mind knows it. Is this a fact? Is this real or is this theory or philosophy? Real, real. yes, it's real. The third one, here comes the trick. The third one is the mind itself, which thinks, which feels, which understands, which remembers, which forgets, that mind the thoughts and feelings and emotions and memories there. There is a witness watching. I, the witness, am illumining this mind. Different from the mind, an unchanging consciousness, this witness consciousness, illumining the mind. Is this real or theory? Ah, you see? Most of us, we will say, most of us, will say, yeah, this is something I learned from the book. I, know, I don't really think about it that way. This is something I learned from the book. Maybe with a lot of sadhana, maybe with many more retreats, I will begin to, I'll begin to appreciate this and it will become real for me. It's not real for me right now. That's what we, most of us will say that. If you could say it's real with conviction, with honesty, with truth, you would be enlightened. And what Vedanta states here, wait for it, what Vedanta states is, it's real right now. And the whole purpose why we say it's not real is because we don't notice it. We are confused about it. And what Vedanta wants to do is clear up that confusion so it becomes as obvious as, yeah, my eyes see the book. Very, very, it's absolutely obvious. I am the infinite consciousness ex experiencing or shining upon the mind and body. It should be as clear as that. Like I seeing this book. That's what Vedanta aims to do. And why we are unable to recognize it is because of this reflected consciousness identified with the ego. What we think we are, we don't think we are the witness consciousness. We think we are the ego. This ego shining in the light of reflected consciousness, this is the villain. We think we are that. Here I am, I, I use the word I for myself. Notice one thing, the seer and the seen are different. Uh, this book is the seen, it's different from you. The eyes are the seen, it's different from the mind. The mind is the seen. If you say the mind is different from me, the mind includes the ego. When I say I, I identify myself with that I. But let me ask you, do you experience the I? This is the crucial question. Do you experience your ego if you sit quietly and do you feel I? Do you feel that? All of us, when we look into the mind, do we feel the ego? Yeah, we can say I. With confidence, we can say, yes, I. I am sitting. Did I, do I feel that? Yep. I am listening. Yes. So the ego is something that is experienced. If it is experienced, it is the scene. And you are the seer of the ego. Do you see where I'm going with this? The ego is the seen. And you are the seer of the ego. Otherwise it wouldn't be experienced. If it is experienced, it's an object just like this. Even the ego, even the eye is an object. I don't mean this eye. I mean the vertical eye. Even that is an object. You are not the ego. You are not the ego. The ego shines in your light. We get identified with the ego and we think we are the ego and the rest of it flows immediately. The ego is identified with the mind and the ego is identified with the body and then we think we are the body and mind. This is how the mechanism works. And the whole purpose of Vedanta is to slice this connection between you and the ego. 
The ego can continue working. The mind will continue working. Memories, everything, body and mind will be perfect, continue working. And yet you will know that I use the body and mind. I am shining in the body and mind, but I am not the body and mind. So the whole strategy of Vedanta is to slice the connection, cut the connection, the apparent connection between you, the witness self, and the ego. Look again at the first line of Shankaracharya's beautiful hymn. I am not the mind, I am not the intellect, I am not the memory, I am not the ego. Mano buddhya hankara chittani naham. I am not the ego. Do you see how, how apparently contradictory it is? When you say I am not the ego, you know what you are saying? You are saying I am not I. The ego is the I. It says I am not the mind, I am not the intellect, I am not the memory, I am not the ego. I am not I. How could that be true? It's true because mind, memory, intellect, ego, they are all objects, they are all experienced. If they are experienced, the simple direct fact, I experience them. Hence, they, I cannot be those things. They are things. Just like this thing. Just like this thing. So now, how do I slice the connection between myself and the ego? Verse 8. The connection between the ego and three things. We have ego connected to three things. One is consciousness, pure consciousness itself, the real you. The other one is the reflected consciousness in the mind. The ego always shines in the reflected consciousness. When you think right now, I, don't you feel I am aware? All the time you feel. The moment you think I, it's an aware I. It's a conscious I. It's an I shining in awareness. So the second thing in with which the ego is connected is this reflected consciousness. And the third thing which with this uh, the consciousness is connected, um, the ego is connected, is the body. Immediately when you say I, automatically it comes, I am this. So the ego, mentally draw a picture, ego, I, is connected with three things. Reflected consciousness, body, pure consciousness. And how are these connections formed and how are they cut? What is our ultimate goal? To cut the connection between the I and the pure consciousness. So I is connected to reflected consciousness, to the body and to pure consciousness. Let's explore these connections. What does it say? Sahajam karmajam bhranti janyam. Trividam. Trividam means three kinds of connections. Kramat means in sequence. The connection between the I ego and reflected consciousness is natural sahajam it's like a mirror and your reflected face imagine your face this face is the original consciousness the mirror is the ego when you put the mirror in front of the face what happens in the mirror there is a reflected face right if you have a mirror in front of your face there is a reflected face and this reflected face and the mirror, what kind of relation do they have? This reflected face and the mirror, what kind of relation do they have? They have a natural relation. Moment there is a mirror, there will be a reflection. Right? Moment there is a mirror, there will be naturally be a reflection. Your face will be reflected in the mirror. This mirror example is very good. Why? Because the ego functions as a mirror, the mind itself functions as a mirror and consciousness is reflected in the mirror. You see the interesting thing is when you hold a mirror in front of yourself, what you see is the mirror and what you see is your reflected face. The original face is not seen. Correct? Your original face is not seen directly. What you see is a reflection. The mind functions in that way. The ego functions in that way. It reflects consciousness. So the awareness that we feel right now is like the reflected face. That it's a reflected consciousness. We experience a reflected consciousness. We do not see ourselves as the original consciousness. That's what's happening. So the first relationship is between the ego, which functions as a mirror, and the reflected consciousness, which is natural to the Mirror. Moment there is a mirror, there is reflected consciousness. The second connection, 
what's the connection between the ego and the body? I am this body, this feeling. What's the connection? Karma jam, born of karma. Because of our past karma, we have this body. Each body is produced by our past karma. We had many bodies earlier. We lived many lives earlier. We are in, in this life now because of our past karma. As long as that portion of our past karma keeps on giving results, this body will continue. As long as this body continues, the ego will be connected to this body. You can't do anything about it. As long as the body continues, this ego will be connected to the body. And the idea is when the body dies, the subtle body, it, it transmigrates to other bodies and then the ego will say, I am this body. This body is forgotten. It's burnt or cremated or buried or whatever. And then you, have, you say a new body, a baby is born and you say, I am this. So the ego is always connected to the body by karma, by our past karma. We have two relations already. The ego is connected to consciousness naturally, one. Ego is connected to this body by past karma. These are not questions we are interested in. The real question we are interested in is, how is the ego connected to that witness self, the pure consciousness? And it comes here, the next one. That's an absolutely stunning point it makes. Bhranti Janyam. There is no connection at all between you and the ego. <laughs> it's incredible what it says. We think we are the ego. And here Vedanta says, it has nothing to do with you. No more than the leaf shaking in the wind, wind is you. It's something, it's an object. The ego is an object. Branti means error. The only connection between you and the ego is error. It's a confusion. It's a misunderstanding. It's error. There was this person who went to a Swami who lived in a cave. Give me freedom, this disciple said. And the Swami said, okay, you stay here. And they put him immediately on a schedule of duties. You clean the cave and you bring food from the village and you conduct the worship. So you have to become a disciple. Then you get the knowledge which gives you freedom. After a month of this, the disciple became irritated. He said, when are you going to give me freedom? If you don't give me freedom, I'm going to go to a different guru. Then the, the Swami thought, oh, I'm going to lose this disciple. So let me give him freedom. Come tomorrow, early in the morning, take a bath, fast, come with a, with a, with a um, pure mind, come in the morning, I'll give you freedom. So this disciple is excited at last. And he comes in the morning and he sees the guru in the early light of the morning. He has come out of the cave and there's a big old tree in front of the cave. And the, and the Swami, the guru is holding that cave and saying, give me freedom, free me, free me, free me. And the disciple said, Swami, just let go. Just let go. And the Swami turned to the disciple and said, precisely. <laughs> just let go. What's the tree which we are holding on to? It's this body-mind. Most precisely, the precise point at which we are holding on is the ego. The ego will continue to exist, but what we are going to say is, I am not the ego. The ego is an instrument. The memory is an instrument. The intellect is an instrument. The mind is an instrument. The body is an instrument. It's not me. Branti Janyam. And now we come to verse number 9. How do you cut this? How do you cut these relationships? Remember the three relationships. You, the ego, you right now. This ego is connected to body by karma. It's connected to the reflected consciousness, naturally, like a mirror and reflection. And it's connected to pure consciousness by no connection at all, by foolishness. So how do you, connect, how do you disconnect the pure, connect, pure consciousness uh, from the ego? So these, how do you cut these three relationships? Verse number nine. Sambandhino satur nasti nivritti sahajasya tu karmakshayat prabodhacha nivartete kramadubhe. How do you cut these three relationships? You have to remember what the three relationships are, of course, and then you proceed to cut them. How do you cut them? As long as the two terms in a natural relationship, as long as the mirror is there, 
there will be a reflected face. True. As long as you have a mirror, your face will be reflected in it. As long as the ego is there, consciousness will be reflected in it. You can't cut it. It will be there. So imagine in deep sleep, for example, the ego does not function and you don't feel the reflected consciousness also. You don't feel aware. You don't feel I am in deep sleep. No, nobody feels that. If you feel that, you are not in deep sleep. So as long as the ego is functioning, consciousness will be reflected there. First, so the first relationship cannot be cut. It's natural. The second relationship, ego and the body. Do you remember? I am this body. How is it cut? It's cut only by the exhaustion of karma. When the karma of this body goes, this body will age and die and the, the ego will proceed to another body. So the relationship between the body and the ego is cut only when karma is exhausted and you get but karma is exhausted means only part of it. It will generate a new new body. And then you have the ego will be related to the new body. But the main point is the third relationship. How is this cut? And the answer is prabodhat, which means by awakening, by knowledge, by illumination, by enlightenment. Just by the knowledge that I am not the mirror, I am not the reflected face. How do you cut the relationship between your real face and the reflected face? Ah, this is a good question. How do you cut the relationship between your f real face and the reflected face? Tell me. There is? There's no relationship, yes. By knowledge, yes. You just know that it's not me. It looks like me. It looks just like me. But it's not me. It's a reflection. It's a part of the mirror. And it's not me. Just by that knowledge, you have cut the relationship between your real face and the reflected face, which looks exactly like a real face. In the same way, we cut the relationship between the ego and the reflected consciousness shining in it and ourselves, the witness consciousness, by knowledge. See, that which is generated by error can only be removed by knowledge. That which is generated by error, the classic example, person is walking and sees a snake and thinks it's a snake and gets scared and comes close to it and sees it's a piece of rope. It's a classic example. Now how do you correct that, that thing? That How do you drive away that snake? The false snake, not a real snake. How do you drive away the false snake? Do you chase it with a stick? No. All you need is knowledge that it's a rope. Then the false snake is gone. Here all you need is knowledge that it's not me. Clearly I am the witness. Why is it not me? Back to the first verse. Because it's an object. The ego is an object. The reflected consciousness shining in the ego is an object. It's not me. Practice seeing the ego as an object. Watch how it behaves. The moment you make the ego an object separate from you, Automatically, mind will be separate from you. Emotions and desires and, and miseries and uh, impulses, all of them will be separate from you. You'll find the mind is much easier to control than. The mind is difficult to control because we think we are the mind. Unhappy? I am unhappy. Mind wants a cookie? I want a cookie. Uh -huh. Right? Everything that the mind does, want, does not want, likes, dislikes, all of those become my likes and dislikes. All of those become my agenda because I have embraced the mind and think it's me. The moment you clearly see it's not me, then you realize all those things are in the mind, but I am untouched. I have two minutes. I'll finish saying this with a little story. It's a story of... Um, the great sage Brihaspati and his son Kacha. Now this son went to study and he studied the Vedas and all sorts of things which were taught in um, ancient India and he came back to his father very proud, thinking that I am more learned than the old man. And his father saw that and he said, well son, you have studied all of this, you have attended all the retreats and you know all of this, you have got all these notes and stuff and you know, have you found peace? And Kacha had to admit, no, not really, I haven't found peace. Then the father said, and asked his father, now how do I get peace? The father says, Tyaga, by renunciation, by giving up. 
So he says, okay, I give up everything. I give up my wealth and all of that. And he goes all over India to the different holy places and comes back. And his father says, have you found peace? He says, no. Then only by renunciation, by giving up, you find peace. And Kachas thinks, what else can I give up? Okay, I give up um, every position, including my little loincloth which I was wearing. I b so nude, he wanders all over India. And there are monks even today who, who actually uh, wander nude in, um, uh, in India. And so I give up everything, including clothes, including I don't want food also. If people feed me, that's all right. Otherwise, I'm not even going to beg for food. And he wanders all over India to the holy places and comes back. And his father says, have you found peace? Not really. How do I find peace? By giving up. The same thing. What else can I give up? And he thinks, okay, this body, ah, I got it. This body, I have to give up the body. So he lights a fire and he's going to jump in the fire. And his father says, wait a minute, son. <laughs> if you do that, this is no way of giving up the body. Why? Because if you do that, the mind with its desires will continue on to the next birth. And you will have, because of your past karma, you will get a new body. And then another body. And body after that. So this is no way of, suicide is no way of giving up the body. Because you'll just, it'll get replaced as soon as you have given it up. And you'll end up in a worse position than you are in. So... That's, by the way, why suicide is highly not recommended in any religion. Um, then Kacha thinks, then how, then how do I give up if I'm not going to destroy the body? He says, then his father tells him the secret. The real giving up is giving up of the ego, of giving up of the mind. Chitta, the mind. The mind has to be give, uh, given up. How do I give up the mind? How do I give up the ego? By knowing that it's not me. It is not I. Realize that the ego and the mind are objects. Just as you treat your clothes and your, um, your iPhone and all of that, the, the mind is a very sophisticated iPhone. That's all that it is. Yeah. And it's got this little ego in it, which, which we identify. How terrible it would be if we, we already are a lot, uh, pretty much identified with the iPhone, but, but if you thought you were the iPhone, it would be terrible. Yeah, so... We think we are this mind. Give up this identification with the mind and there you have it. Then you will find peace. You get peace immediately. The nature of the pure self, of pure consciousness is peace. Uh, you remember the story where the man went to the Swami asking for peace and the Swami said the, um, the peace of the mind is also no peace. Uh, restlessness of the mind, you are the witness. Peace of the mind, you are the witness. So that is giving up of the mind, knowing that I am not the mind, I am not the ego. And that's all for now, and we will meet again in the evening.